Buenas tardes y a todos eh, y todas desde la Escuela Española de Historia y Arqueología en Roma. Eh, nuevamente estamos en las conferencias de Online Talks, que, que como creo ya saben la mayoría, la organizamos con nuestros colegas Miriam Cuba de la Universidad de Alcalá y Harry Rosson de la Universidad de York. Eh, queremos dar las gracias a la dirección y compañeros de la Escuela de Historia y Arqueología en Roma, eh, porque evidentemente sin ellos esto no sería posible, y especialmente a Mateo Benati, que está en la parte técnica. Uh, now it is, it is a pleasure to introduce Ferran Antolin. Ferran Antolin is currently uh, head of the Division of Natural Science at the German Archaeological Institute and of the Archaeobotany Lafinit. He is also professor for Archaeobotanic or Archaeobotanic at the University of Basel since 2021. In 2017, uh, um, he was granted a prestigious um, uh, project. Uh, the name is uh, Ari Change Project, and became assistant professor at the same university. His research activity has focused uh, on the study of past farming economies with a particular emphasis on the interdisciplinary environmental approaches to wetland uh, sites in Southern Europe. Uh, thank you, Ferran, for the invitation, for, the, for this conference, for accepting this conference. Uh, you have around 45 minutes, more or less. And for all people, uh, you can see this conference by YouTube and it's possible made the, the, your question by the chat of people. Thank you, Ferran. Thank you, Juan, Miriam, and Harry for the invitation. It's a real honor to participate in your series of talks. I've been following them over the past months and I'm now trying to share the full screen mode of my presentation. I hope it's okay. So today I'm going to speak about uh, the project AgriChange that Juan just presented. The project ended recently, but of course we still are working on the results generated. I like to start with this image often because it shows what happens when you choose a diverse number of crops to be grown at a site. Here you see barley on the left, which is already um, ripe. This is late June of last year, while the weeds here you have emmer and einkorn are still green and millets, for instance, here to the right are still quite small. So you can see how uh, opting for a, a very agro-biodiverse um, farming strategy um, enhances the possibilities of having a good harvest by expanding the harvest season. Today I'm going to speak about Neolithic farming in the Northwest Mediterranean area. So after a short introduction, I will go into the AgriChange project and its aims and what we uh, manage to do or what we aim to do during the project. And then I will focus, instead of presenting a synthesis of all of the data, which would take too much time, on I will focus on the main aim of the project, which was to identify agricultural changes and then try to investigate which were the reasons or the context of those changes. And these, you already have a, um, a spoiler here on the periods where we have been able to identify crop changes in our study area. So the Neolithic in the Northwest Mediterranean area starts shortly after 6000 BC, and it lasts until up around 2300 BC. We have collated all published radiocarbon dates until 2020 approximately and published the full data set in the paper that you have cited here. And on this map, you see the data points or the site location points for um, dated uh, Neolithic sites in our study area. This has been the basis for uh, many analysis, one of them being the spread of farming in the area. Um, 
it is very well known that the, we observe a coastal expansion of the Neolithic in the Western Mediterranean areas, and that then rivers are one of the major uh, routes of spread of these farming practices. And it was of particular interest for us to connect the Mediterranean coastal area with uh, Switzerland for the reasons I will explain in a minute. And we can see here how the arrival of the Neolithic is quite later uh, for the Swiss plateau, which first has some influence from the Central European Lineavan keramic, but it, it is only later by the end, last quarter of the fifth millennium that is um, that farming spreads into this area permanently. And in this series of maps um, that Hector Martinez Grau prepared, you can see time slices. So every 200 years, the um, location of the dated sites in the study area. And it's quite interesting because we see processes of expansion like this one that seems to culminate here from a very qualitative evaluation of the data and then contraction, expansion again around 3,900, what seems to be contraction afterwards and again uh, roughly 1,000 years after that. Because actually in our study area, and of course gener generalizations for such a large area are difficult, but we mostly uh, investigate small sized settlements, mostly uh, non larger than 50 inhabitants, occasionally uh, much larger, but that would not be the rule according to the current state of research. We have many cave sites, um, but still we speak about sedentary settlements. But of course, cave sites as a source of, uh, let's say, at least archaeobotanical data, they are very much influenced by the type of use of the cave, which is not always or not most of the time for um, inhabiting. And instead, it will, uh, it, they were used as penning areas for um, animals. So here you have a pretty um, orthophoto map of Kansa Durnim, um, where you can see uh, the different uh, concentrations of ashes, which are actually also known as fumias, because these are, consist mainly of burned dung. So this is a major um, taphonomic pathway uh, for archaeobotanical remains coming from caves, although we have other types of contexts, such as funerary contexts as well. So this is the sort of um, picture we could have for a, an inner deposit in a cave that was then burned, and all that remains from huge, um, potentially huge piles of dung and organic remains are these small lenses of ashes and charred material. But most of the um, open air sites look like this. So they are not quite the same as we are used to in the Lineaban keramic in Central Europe and certainly not like tell sites in the Balkan area. We have loads of negative structures, not always defining dwelling areas, mostly um, silo pits and different sorts of pits of difficult um, interpretation and sometimes wells. We are lucky enough, though, to have some, or actually, if we consider also Switzerland, plenty of um, waterlogged uh, settlement layers, so complete sites that are preserved under waterlogged conditions. And like this, we don't only have some um, plant remains that are preserved in them, like would be the case of wells, but complete um, dwelling structures, for instance of course not uh, in C2, but they can be reconstructed. And this is the case of La Draga in Northeast Spain. So using um, anthrop anthropological references by John Robb um, or synthesized by John Robb, we have to imagine these communities with um, small amounts of adult people larger proportions of 
children and younger individuals and a few elderly people. And this may explain why we think networks were so important for the Neolithic period, because with this social structure, you certainly need these networks with, according to Rob, again, um, between seven and 19 other similar groups so that um, the whole social and biological reproduction is possible. And it's clear that in this sort of communities, labor force is a limiting factor. What we observe is a subsistence based on a large diversity of plant and animal resources. So not just cereals, but also oil plants and um, pulses and probably an integrated plant and animal management, which supports the idea of uh, using permanent fields and not uh, a an, uh, more shifting type of agriculture as it had been proposed uh, some decades ago. This is part of the um, whole crop set that we know in our study area. So we have some gloom weeds such as einkorn or emmer, but also timofaves wheat, and then free threshing cereals such as durum wheat, naked barley and hulled barley. But we also have some oil plants such as opium poppy, flax, and several pulses. I'm only showing here lentil and fava bean, but there's also pea, for instance. This is the color coding we've used in most of the work, not all of them. I just realized when preparing this presentation that you will um, follow. So it's quite interesting for us to see um, the shifts between gloom weeds and free threshing cereals because they imply a series of processes of, uh, of processing stages that are different, also different ways of consuming them and tastes. So um, it's um, quite a different type of um, organization that is required by um, either focusing on free threshing cereals or gloom weeds. They also have slightly different soil and climatic requirements. So we've been paying attention to these um, shifts over time. In general, we can say that gloom weeds are better adapted to a wetter climate because the free threshing cereals are normally naked cereals and they are more prone to be affected by fungi, etc. But on the other hand, free threshing cereals are easier to process. They are generally highly appreciated. So they have other advantages that usually explain that when they are possible to be cultivated, they are cultivated. The main factors we've considered to be influencing uh, crop changes are climate variability, pests, and technological innovations or um, different sorts of innovations. We think we should be working on a domestic scale of decision making. This has been observed with analysis uh, of different kinds in other areas of Europe. So that's kind of our starting point also. There's no um, supra-site um, level of decision-making that we know of at the time. So basically, um, people could resort to different storage practices, different agrobiodiversity or pest management strategies to cope uh, with these um, different type of risks. Of course, exchange networks um, must have also increased resilience through shared knowledge, but also possibly spread some of these risks, such as um, pests. Neolithic agriculture can be quickly summarized into worlds when it comes to Europe. The Danubian spread of farming mainly involved gloom weeds, also pea, lentil, and barley. While in Southern Europe, naked wheat and naked barley um, are retained and a large variety of pulses, plus um, the appearance of opium poppy uh, in the Western Mediterranean. So we certainly have at the starting point a larger um, crop diversity in the area. And this is something we have summarized in a recent paper. 
So we were particularly interested in studying this contact area between the Central European and the Mediterranean uh, farming worlds, if we want to call it like that. And because we wanted to study agricultural change, we did not only focus on archaeobotanical data, but also uh, small animals, um, insect remains. We looked at um, storage practices, and we did a lot of radiocarbon dating and stable isotope analysis. So some of the main questions we had was when and why do we observe changes in crop assemblages? Which agricultural risk can we detect archeologically? Can we trace risk reducing strategies? And how did climate variability interplay in the history of farming? A project like this would have not been possible with a very, without a very interdisciplinary team that you can see now on the slide people working on C14 stable isotopes, archaeobotany, um, paleogenetics, um, computational archaeology, insect remains, small animals, and storage practices. And the project is still ongoing. So for instance, the paleogenetic research is now only starting. And we did Part of the tasks of the project were basically collating data that had already been produced, so archaeobotanical data in the study area, radiocarbon dates, and the silo pits that had been already documented through um, rescue or um, research archaeology. But we also included loads of new analysis. Um, so here you see on the slide, the uh, dry sites that we investigated in black and the red um, dots indicate wet sites. It's on the uh, wet sites that we did interdisciplinary research involving also insect remains, small animals, and so on. The other sites were basically investigated from an archaeobotanical point of view combined with stable isotopes and radiocarbon dates. So we basically did as much as we could and the project, as I said, continues. We are now studying samples from a well in Port Marianne, southern France, Metal Neolithic, and we are working on machine learning approaches, modeling the location of Neolithic settlements in the area and under which uh, climatic conditions the crops were growing uh, in individual sites. So this is the work of Maria Elena Castiello. When we put the radiocarbon dates we've been generating together and we are still waiting for results, we get these different curves. So they are split into um, crop types. And we have an early phase where the gloom weeds are very well represented. Then we have a phase where naked wheat um, becomes um, dominant in this curve followed by a period where there are almost no gloom weeds, but loads of pre-threshing cereals. Then gloom weeds reappear again. And the last phase again with significant amounts of gloom weed. This actually mirrors quite well the curves that we get when we plot the archaeobotanical data on a semi-quantitative scale. So indicating kind of importance of each taxon at the site, following the um, pottery chronology, so um, relative chronology. And it shows that probably most sites have been correctly classified following this criteria. And we observed this first phase with gloom weeds, then the free threshing cereals, then gloom weeds appearing again, and eventually um, barley and gloom weeds. If we were to summarize this in a very simple way, we would see chronologically the spread of a large diversity of crops. Here we only see the cereals, so emmer, einkorn, naked wheat, and naked barley. And then from 5500 BC, they start spreading inland. And we still observe this full diversity of crops. 
but after 5200 and until 4000 BC, when these um, farming practices spread all over the study region, we see a dominance in the area that is marked now with the arrows of naked wheat and barley. Northeastern Italy always has a, a more similar patterning to that one observed in the Balkans. After 4000 BC, we see an, an increase of gloom weeds in the Mediterranean area. So, but not only einkorn and emmer, but also Timofevi's wheat, this wheat that was not identified for many uh, decades in archaeobotany, but now uh, we are certain that we can identify it. And our hypothesis is that these gloom weeds probably come from either Northeast Germany, uh, Italy, or uh, the Balkans, where they have been growing this set of uh, weeds since the early Neolithic. And only in the later stage of our study um, period, we have emmer in the Swiss area. So in the previous moment, they were still growing mostly naked wheat and naked barley, like in the Mediterranean area, but then they incorporate emmer possibly an influence from the East. The uh, storage capacity analysis will be summarized in this slide because we are still working on those um, regional comparisons with Georgina Prats. But what I can tell you is that we mostly have relatively low capacity. So between five, 570 and 800 liters per structure in general. These capacities only seem to increase from the Bronze Age and especially the late Bronze Age onwards. And they might be mirroring the production capacity of households at the time. So maybe not as high as we would expect from traditional farming societies. So what about the risks and um, hazards that um, farmers had to face in the Neolithic period. Until very recently, all synthesis of uh, pests in Europe were lacking um, significant evidence of their presence in the Western Mediterranean. After our analysis, we can confirm that, especially in sites with waterlogged preservation, we have been able to find the wheat weevil and grain beetle, but also pea weevil and wood mouse, which was probably quite widespread, but I'm here showing our own analysis. The climatic context was, of course, extremely important for the project. And we were lucky enough that there was um, this paper published by Carter et al. in 2021. And Maria Elena Castillo managed to uh, compute those data applied for our study area. So here you can see the evolution of the annual mean temperature and the annual precipitation for our study area. And below in colors, you see the, these changes from gloom weeds to free threshing cereals and gloom weeds again. So we see in general an increase of the annual mean temperature and the annual precipitation is where we have maybe more significant changes with this dry phase here around 5,300 and this very wet, wet phase here around uh, 2,900 BC. But we of course wanted to have um, high resolution data that could apply to our crops and for this, we relied on previous research on stable isotope analysis in order to measure uh, water and nutrient availability for the crops themselves. Cereals are quite sensitive to weather, so they need um, um, pretty dry uh, or uh, not too cold conditions when they are growing, then they need some water when they are generating the fruit and they need again the weather to be dry again when uh, the fruit is uh, ripening. So in the Mediterranean area, it will be water what's going to be the limiting factor 
in other areas of Europe, um, water was for sure available in sufficient quantities, and then it was more about the timing. And the advantage of the use of uh, stable isotope analysis or, or stable isotope ratios is that they inform us about the conditions of growth of those cereal grains while they were in the process of infilling. So it, it will depend on the species, but we are roughly speaking about the period between mid-April and mid-June. We will use the um, discriminated um, carbon-13 as a proxy for water availability. And um, the ratio, um, the delta um, N15 for nutrient availability, but we will always be taking into account what, it, what goes on with the carbon, because um, if we see shifts in carbon, they might mirror into this uh, opposite sort of trend in the nitrogen. So we will mainly work with the nitrogen data when carbon is stable at one site. And we try to date all of the samples from where we did the stable isotope analysis so that we were sure of um, the chronological um, range of the data we were generating. So I will go into these three moments of change that we have observed in the project, starting with uh, the period around 5,400 BC. Um, Oh, sorry, I think this slide is now misplaced because it, it presents the three moments of change. And we will start with the first one, 5,300 BC. A second one will be around 4,000 BC and the last one around 3,000 BC. And you can now see how they relate to this um, paleoclimatic uh, modeled curve. Plus, I've indicated here with the triangles, those moments where we could see in the maps before that we kind of reached the maximum spread of sites coexisting uh, within a time frame of 200 years. And they roughly coincide with some of these shifts. So it might be worth investigating further, although we have not done this yet. So we start with the first um, crop shift around 5,300. And for this, we investigated uh, coastal or uh, nearly coastal sites in the Mediterranean area that were dating to the first thousand years of agricultural practices. You can see them here in the map. We even expanded our study area a bit to the south to include um, Cova de las Cendras and Cova de Lor in Alicante. And we have both cave sites and open air sites. Here you can see the results of the archibotanical analysis, starting with Arena Candy there, where there's a good proportion of gloom weeds together with naked wheat and naked barley. Similar, similarly important proportions of gloom weeds are observed in other sites dated older than 5,200. And then the sites that follow up, so dated after 5,200 mostly, uh, they show mostly free threshing cereals, naked wheat and naked barley. So we did the stable isotope analysis for uh, samples from all of these sites. And in the graph to the left, you see only single values that were all obtained from dated um, serial finds. So here we have a lot less information per sample, but we have the highest chronological resolution we can have. And what we can see is that we observe slightly lower um, carbon values around 5,400, then increasing afterwards. When we look at the full um, number of analysis per site phase, these are also classified um, or, or in chronological order. 
We also see this phase here around 5,400 with lower values and samples from the same sites that are dated slightly later, like these two here from Cova de las Cendras, show higher values. So it is really uh, not at just one site, but multiple sites dated at this precise moment that indicate possibly drier conditions of growth for cereals. And because this coincides with this completely independent um, modeled um, paleoclimatic curve showing drier conditions, we do think that in this case, we have enough evidence to say that farmers arrive to the area with a large um, crop diversity. And after this dry and possibly also cold episode, they decided to reduce that um, crop diversity. And that's what allowed them to um, adapt or to survive through this um, climatic um, um, deterioration, if we want to call it like that. So it was thanks to having this broader crop set that it was possible to then choose a narrower one, which was then used during the fifth millennium. And we could um, argue that with um, relative success since we have plenty of evidence for it. The following phase is around 4000 BC. So after roughly a thousand years of having been cultivating naked wheat and naked barley in the area. And we are going to focus on two sites. One is Isolino, Virginia in Northwestern Italy in Lake Varese, a pile dwelling site or a wet site. It's an artificial island in the small Lake of Varese and Libanol which is an open air site in, Pro in Provence that um, yielded three wells with waterlogged preservation. So here you can see Le Bagnol with one of the wells and the, the spread of the um, two settlement faces at the site, one dating mostly before 4000 BC and, and the second one dating to after 4000 BC. And here you see the results of um, the archaeobotanical analysis. Actually, only a summarized version, but all proxies show the same trend. So economy was based at the beginning on naked uh, wheat and naked barley, and progressively gloom wheats increase until they become dominant in the record. Both in the chart and the uncharted archaeobotanical assemblages. Interestingly, we could identify crop pests at the site thanks to the excellent preservation conditions. And what we observe is an increase of those of the presence of those pests until 4000 BC and a very clear decrease after 4000 BC. Of course, these numbers are difficult to interpret because they come from a well, but um, it's interesting that the presence is not uh, constant through time and that the presence of gloom weeds coincides with a much lower amount of evidence for crop pests. Actually, this is just uh, uh, the insects and, and Small animals are just um, two types of the pests that affect cereals. There are other pests that are very difficult for us to trace, such as fungal pests, like the one you see here on the picture at the center, the loose smut. And actually at Libano, also in the, in the latest phase, we seem to have um, some very badly preserved uh, free threshing uh, cereal rachises and in the same sample, loads of these unidentified objects that we tentatively identified as um, fungi. Of course, only a proposal. 
until someone helps us with this identification, but it might be showing multiple types of problems with the growth of uh, free threshing cereals at the time before we see the increase of the gloom weeds. I mentioned stable isotope analysis before. We uh, used a few chart grains that we had for this. And here you see the results. Basically, we see a lot of stability, especially in the carbon data, which, as I mentioned before, allows us to look a, li a little bit more into detail into the nitrogen because uh, there does not seem to be big changes in precipitation. And we do have something very interesting in the nitrogen values of naked wheat of the latest phase after 4000 BC, when naked wheat is actually the smallest proportion of all the wheats. And we see higher values of nitrogen. And we interpret these results as an intention of farmers of still getting a good um, harvest of naked wheat, but not quite managing to obtain it. Isolino Virginia starts earlier on in the fifth millennium, maybe in the uh, latest uh, centuries of the sixth millennium, and has a more or less um, continuous occupation with uh, uh, some hiatuses until the fourth millennium BC. And here you see its chronological um, relationship to other pile dwellings. And most importantly for us, that it's very closely related to the pile dwellings north of the Alps. And it kind of covers that chronological gap that we had between La Draga and the first pile dwellings in, in the Alps. Here we see the same trend we observed archibotanically in Libano. So we have first an economy based on naked wheat and naked barley and progressively an increase of um, gloom weeds in these dark and green colors. The same happens with the crop pests. So we have an increase in their presence and numbers in the second phase right before 4000 BC and uh, a very sharp decrease of their presence in the youngest phase. We only studied core, so we can also discuss endlessly about the representativeness of the samples we investigated, but this is the trend so far, and it's very similar to the trend we have in Le Bagnol. In both cases, it would be very interesting to confirm it with further analysis at the same site or in other sites. Here you can see some of the beautiful archaeobotanical remains found at the site. This is the uh, previously mentioned new gloom wheat with a very characteristic spikelet fork. And here the stable isotope analysis. I'm only showing nitrogen because again, the carbon values were stable through time. So no evidence of changes in precipitation and extremely high showing um, a very wet climate, which is to be expected for this region. We don't see changes in nitrogen in barley, so the growth conditions seem to stay constant. But in wheat, instead, we see a decrease after the first phase. So that, that's naked wheat. So it could be indicating that after a first phase where naked wheat received the best soils, maybe it, it was less and less the focus of um, farmers and eventually replaced by gloom weeds. Maybe because the harvest uh, was lower than expected. When we put this data into the context of um, the study area, this is a paper we just submitted to the Holocene we see that the same trend can be observed at a very broad scale. So this line here is indicating us more or less 4000 BC. Most of the sites dated before 4000 BC show uh, farming based on naked wheat and naked barley. After 4000 BC, we see this increase, sometimes dominance, but not always, of bloom weeds. So this is not a local process, although there are local uh, decisions that are taken. So not all sites do the same, but 
there is a general trend that uh, applies to plenty of sites in this large area from Northwest Italy to Catalonia. This is what I just Hola, mentioned. ¿Me escuchas? Sí. sí. Mira, tenemos un pequeño problema con el YouTube. Lo que tienes que hacer, vamos a intentar que eh, salgas, de, salgas de, la, de la conexión y vuelvas a entrar. Bueno, salgas del, del PowerPoint y vuelvas a entrar. Vamos a ver si funciona. Lo siento, ¿eh? Lo, te está tocando todo hoy. ¿Comparto? Sí, compartes, a ver. Se puede. Un segundito, ¿eh? Un segundito. Un momento. A ver, un segundito, ¿eh? Que estoy mirando en el YouTube. Un segundo, tío. Vale, ya está. Lo siento. Ok, ¿eh? Sí, se ve la pantalla sí. compartida. Sí. Okay, sorry about that. I hope you can still follow. Basically, the point of this slide was saying, yes, we can observe a very interesting sub-regional process of um, shift from free threshing to gloom weeds or cereals. And, uh, but we see local processes. So for instance, in Libanol, there was an intention of keeping naked wheat at the site, but not apparently at Isolino, where the shift to Einkorn and Emmer was much clearer. For the last um, crop shift, we are moving northwards to Switzerland. Um, this is a very well-known uh, crop change that had been identified already in previous work by the colleagues in Basel. You see a summary here of the trends per site of the, di the different um, wheat species, basically indicating a dominance of naked wheat, both observed in grain and chaff um, for the first centuries after the onset of um, pile dwellings in the area, but then a progressive shift towards emmergrain. But I chose a case study that kind of nuances this macro trend just to make the point that local scale of decision making is important. And this site is Zugrit Mat. Actually, uh, we just published this data. So I'm going to give you a short summary, but I hope you still uh, read the paper. Zugrit Mat is uh, located in, in Eastern Switzerland. It was a small excavation of um, some uh, 80 square meters, and but it was extremely uh, well sampled. So in great detail, you see all of the profile samples indicated here in this sketch on the right. And also with large bulk samples to compare with. Most significantly, this project was part of a taphonomy project uh, led by um, uh, Philip Renzel at the University of Basel. And the different sedimentary deposits were investigated in great detail. And four uh, settlement units or stratigraphic units indicating settlement phases were identified within this very um, deep deposit of around one meter of organic remains. This has not always been possible in pile dwelling settlements. So it was a unique opportunity to work at a very high resolution level, how econ economy might evolve at a local scale. So after doing Bayesian modeling of um, some 30 uh, radiocarbon dates with um, interesting uh, postquem and antequem, um, parameters, we reached the conclusion that these phases must have lasted around 10 years, so very uh, short lasting phases. Here you see the two sorts of samples that we use, both how they looked in real life and where they came from at the site, so it's basically these locations with kind of 
highlighted um, numbers. And the last one would be here. And these are the bulk samples that were clearly associated to settlement phases. It was not as easy or as possible to do as with the, the profile samples. And so we could analyze how um, economic strategies shifted through time at the site with these different units that you see here. And you also have the different types of samples. Now it's not so important to look at the details, but you can see how MR is important all through uh, the occupation. MR is, I already said this, an important crop in Switzerland at the time, but towards the upper layers, these two units, six and eight, we have a lot more naked wheat. Also, we have a lot more um, oil plants in the earliest phases and less after. We also see changes in the gathered plants. So this basically indicates that at least um, it's clear that the economy is flexible and not always um, the same. We transferred those raw counts into calories to see if they mirrored the importance of the different resources in the diet and if we could observe changes over time. And this is what you see here. Basically, uh, a start with uh, high importance of um, cultivated plants, then a phase where gathered plants might have been very important, and then an increase again of cultivated plants towards the end. And not just this increase on cultivated plants, but the increase of naked wheat towards the end, which goes against the trend that I said that in this period we have more emmer. It goes together with the results that we had from this stable isotope analysis. This time we did this analysis on chaff remains, waterlogged chaff remains, because we didn't have enough grains. And what we see is a progressive, uh, and a trend towards a drier um, growing conditions, which was confirmed with the paleoecological analysis of the plant remains. So we see change, a changing environment towards drying, drier conditions of growth, not necessarily climate change, but drier conditions of growth. And this might explain why the naked wheat harvest might have been better, and we have a better representation of naked wheat at the site in this youngest phase, which is also very interesting. And that's because the location of the site is very particular. It's at the delta of the Lord's River in Lake Zuc, and the, the archaeologists are quite quite certain that this was a changing environment. So plants were not growing um, in the same sort of uh, environment, even though if they were planted in the same soils, because that environment was actually changing during the hundred years when the site was inhabited. So that was an excellent example of how economy could change also at a very local scale. And we need high resolution data to investigate this. If we put this in a broader con context with the data from Lake Zurich, we can also um, explain this shift towards Emmer along with a more consistently wetter climate that we see here in the model data, again, from the paper by Carger. And maybe it, it went all together, plus more influences uh, from uh, social groups to the east of Switzerland, where emmer was an important crop as well. So a multiplicity of factors playing together, most likely. Short conclusions. Um, we have been able to recognize moments of change that, that surprisingly for us can be identified at a relatively large scale. Of course, the local shifts will require a finer grained type of analysis and they probably also exist, but it's interesting that we can identify them over large areas. The first period is around 5,300, where we observe drier and colder climatic conditions, and there were choices available, and eventually this situation is overcome through a narrower um, crop spectrum. 
at 4000 BC, we see a combination of probably networks reaching Eastern Europe, plus the appearance of pests of different kinds affecting the free threshing cereals, especially naked wheat, but also naked barley, and the adoption of crops that were secondary or sometimes not present at, at those sites. Towards the end of the fourth millennium, probably with the wetter climate, Again, with a broad range of crops available, um, farmers may choose to um, favor those crops that adapt better um, or that thrive better in those uh, climatic conditions. So actually it was important to combine this um, archibotanical dynamics that we observe with other proxies that indicate possible risks and may help us to explain uh, or give a narrative to the, the um, that shift. Of course, causalities are among the most difficult uh, aspects of our project because um, we can never know why a farmer decides to grow a different plant. We can just explain in which context that uh, shift happened. I think it's also clear that the potential of stable isotope analysis to give a context to those uh, decisions and see also the local scale of decision making and what remains to be done is the social context of it. So how exchange networks must have influenced not only the spread of crops, but also of pests and ideas and yeah, how population dynamics may also explain choices of uh, crops. And with this, I reach my final slide and I thank you for your attention. Yeah, thank you so much, Ferran, for your contribution. It was really interesting. And um, wow, it's an amazing project. I have a question. Uh, can you see any, any kind of demic migration related to this kind of change in crop growth? No, you mean the one around 4000 BC, right? Yeah, exactly, yeah. There are changes in pottery tradition in, in southern France. And I've discussed this a little bit with uh, Samuel Van Willigen, who was mm -hmm. doing an, uh, studies there of uh, pottery decoration and so on. And, and it kind of coincides with the La Robert phase of the Chassin um, period. But yeah, it's, it has never been detected that there might have been, you know, a wave of yeah. migration from the Balkan at that moment, but it would be interesting to check it out. Yeah, yeah, it's quite interesting because I don't know if you have any data of the archaeological remains related to that, because it, it seems quite normal if you can see this change in agriculture could be related to cattle or the introduction of new kind of cattle of management or something like that. Mm. We didn't include the archaeological data in the project as it yes, it's a huge amount of yeah. work that would have been necessary there to gather all those information. But uh, to my knowledge there, the local environment is sometimes more important than uh, the period. And I try to explain it in the sense that in mountain areas, you have more sheep and goat and in, in the lowland, you have more cattle. And it's rare that you have the opposite. So maybe you have to go to a different level of uh, analysis of the faunal data with isotopes and biometrical analysis and not just the proportions, which is what we were doing with the cereals. But of yeah. course it would be uh, incredible to be able to combine yeah. both. There is an amazing way to compare proxies, you know, your project will be great for that because it will be the perfect basis to include more proxies with data, with of course, fauna remains, pottery, of course, uh, genetic data, population, isotopes, you know, it's, yes. it's great. Wow, well done. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Ah, I see a question on YouTube. 
I, 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 I will check. Alisa. Yes, there is one in YouTube. Um, Alisanti says, thank you for the nice talk. Do you see some kind of crop rotation in your material? Are the crops sown during the spring or autumn? Ah, that's Santeri. Ah, yeah, it's Santeri, uh, sorry. So, hello. Um, that's a very good question. And I wish our data set could uh, allow us to go into that sort of detail. It is partly the type of context that we have, partly also that we don't find a lot of weeds that we can go into great detail on the analysis of the um, um, crop husbandry practices. So regarding crop rotation, it would be just a speculation from saying that in most samples where we have a lot of naked barley, there are always a few grains of naked wheat. Uh, could this be from the previous um, year or something like that, maybe, but no evidence of uh, rotation with pulses, for instance. And I guess for that, you would uh, need more better assemblages from close context and in enough um, richness of data with weeds and so on to be able to evaluate it. And the same a little bit with the sowing season, we assume and our data seem to indicate autumn sowing, but we cannot be sure that in none of the sites there could have been uh, spring sown crops. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, Juan, do you have any question or? Sorry, I cannot hear you. No. Yes, now it's perfect. Uh, for me, it's very interesting to see the, the, the information around the pests and the climate because uh, this. Uh, this information can change the interpretation around the agriculture practice and the, and the occupation of the sites. Uh, this is important. We, we need to think it is important to analyze in our sites. I think in, in Marmota, for example, uh, probably it's important to see this information. Uh, and for this, congratulations. Yeah. And I have only one question. I think probably we, we speak around this uh, some time, but uh, uh, do you think it's not it's difficult to compare uh, the information of, uh, of the site with different quantity of seeds? If, for example, La Draga with, uh, with another site with, I don't know, 20, 30 seeds, for example. Not it's difficult. What do you think about it? Yes, of course. Um, I think the comparisons are possible once you have a certain amount of sites. So you cannot build a trend with three sites per phase and one site has a million seeds and the other two have 30. But once you have a pattern that you can recognize in 10 sites or more and you keep analyzing sites and they fit into the pattern, then I even use them when they um, yield, you know, 10 fines or so, because especially for the question before, after 4,000 BC, I have some sites with only like 10 grains or imprints of grains, but after 4,000 BC, all of them are green weeds. Mm -hmm. So then they, they reinforce the pattern. In 50 years time, it would be certainly necessary to remove them from the analysis, but now it, they help to, to, to identify these um, patterns of change. So I would definitely use them. But I mean, this is like the first step where you identify what, on a very broad scale, which are the big shifts, and then it would be time to go in detail and check the type of context and what could they mean? Because, you know, in this data set, we have a little bit of everything from um, animal dung to um, stored material, et cetera. So there's, there would be a lot of noise, actually. Thank you. 
And yes, it would be extremely interesting to, to see insect data from La Marmota that, because it's such an old and, and unique pile dwelling and maybe we see connections with other pile dwellings. So that's going to be very, very interesting. And I'm sure you will have um, insect remains preserved there. Yep. Yeah, I'm going to check it. I think we don't have more questions in our YouTube channel. So, so thank you so much, Ferran, for this contribution. Thank you so much for yeah. saying yes to our invitation. It's always a pleasure. So, and of course, be free to share your research with us when you want. We will be so happy to share your research. So thank you so much for this. Thank you, it was a pleasure. Bye. Okay, ciao. Bye. Ciao. Thank you, Stefan.